All right, back you are tuning in to Charter's Nation. My pleasure to have with us here today co-author Mark Hershon. Uh, authored, I Hate People, Kick Loose from the Overbearing and Underhanded Jerks at Work and Get What You Want Out of Your Job. Mark, welcome to Trader's Nation. How are you today? Thank you, Kurt. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good, good, good. You know, I hate people too, and I hope nobody likes it, Mark, <laughs> for crying out loud. All right. Uh, well, what, what brought you to write this uh, this this hateful people book? <laughs> well, well, my my co-author Jonathan Lippman and I we we took a look around, and uh, although I hate people is a bit of a personal mantra for me, it really isn't about hating people. It's more about having to deal with people's behavior in the workplace. Sure, yeah. uh, and trying to keep them out of your face long enough to get your work done. Right, right. And there's and there is those. There's believe it or not. I, I, I've gone through, and it's a fantastic book, I Hate People, but there's a lot of different people in different scenarios that distract people from doing their jobs, right? That's the problem. I mean, we've, we've got a list we've got in the book called The Ten Least Wanted, which are uh, some of the more um, egregious uh, uh, behaviors that go on that, that really get in the way of your productivity more than anything. Some of them can re- actually really you know, hobble your career Sure. Uh, if they're in the wrong position. If you've got, say, a, uh, a stop sign as a boss, that's one of the types. Uh, these are the guys that, you know, they, they're the devil's advocate. A- everything you do is wrong. You can't do anything you want. And uh, if, the, if they pop up too early in, like, creative sessions and things like that, they can really kill projects before they even get off the ground. Sure, sure. All right, so that's one good example. You know what I noticed, too? You need to add this in your next, in your next revision. You need to end, add time bandits. Because these time bandits are people that no matter what they do, they always try to distract you, and they have nothing better to do other than waste their time, but waste somebody else's time. And I call them time bandits. You know what? I... uh Maybe we actually have the minute man who's exactly what you're saying, but I love time band, and I wish I'd called you before we wrote the book. That's okay. Listen to your next one. Put it in there. <laughs> but that's what they are. These, these minute men are the guys that say, hey, can I just have a minute of your time sure. and another minute and another minute? Right, right. And before you know it, your whole day is gone. Be gone before you know it. All right, so um, navigating pitfalls. What's the best way to navigate pitfalls and stop these signs of time bandits and, and uh, all these others that are in your workplace? Well, you know, the best of all possible worlds would be you could just confront them honestly about how their behavior is, is getting in your way. But that, that's oftentimes very uncomfortable, and a lot of times it's very difficult if it's a boss you're dealing with. Right. So the, the next best thing is to try and minimize your contact with the, these abrasive personalities. Sure. And if that means saying, you know what, here's the stuff I really have to get done today. If I can just go off to a cafe or a park somewhere for an hour, yeah. that'll be great. So oftentimes you can kind of get leave to go by going, hey, guys, I'm going on a coffee run. Does anybody want anything? Right. And, and by the time you come back, just make sure you remember to bring the coffee with you. Right, right. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, because that's a big problem if you don't bring anything back, especially where you were supposed to have gone, and especially if you don't bring anything back for the boss. All right, so let's say you can't get out of the office, but you don't have a door on your cubicle. Now what? Well, there's there's ways to uh, sort of foil visitors to your cubicle. One one way is to reposition yourself so you've got your back to the opening. Yeah, landmine. Uh, that that helps for uh, the casual visitor. But uh, we've uh, in in doing our research, we heard about um, groundhogging, or it's also called prairie dogging in some areas of the country. And that's where these people pop their heads up over the sides of the yes. cube. Yes. And uh, my, my writing partner, Jonathan Lippman, suggested getting a big mallet so you can play whack-a-mole in your cube farm. I love that. Or a paper clip. Oh, goggles <laughs> yeah, are necessary. Right, right in the a, eye. Yeah, a paper clip and a rubber band's another good one, too, Mark. But, you know, we've got to hand out goggles beforehand. That's right. But See, there's also, I mean, usually those cubicles, there'll be a little guest chair. Uh, yeah. We've got some people we've talked to that just keep that piled high with, with books. So yeah. it discourages casual visitors from stopping by. Right, right. All right, so let's say somebody really enjoys their work, but the distractions around them is obviously is a big problem. All right, so what's the best situation? You said go out and maybe get some coffee or maybe isolate yourself in another area of the, of the workplace. Um, would that be known as a soloist that you have written in there? Yeah, the, the soloist is sort of the main character in the book who's, who, who's doing battle against the ten least wanted and the other office distractions. And yeah. that, that's really uh, this, this person that turns out to be a lot of the workers in today's corporate America that just need a little time to be alone to actually get their work done between 20, 73 interruptions a day, which is the average. Yeah. And meetings upon meetings that are just about having other meetings, there's very little me time left in the office. Right. 
So our book is sort of how to learn how to start shoehorning little bits and pieces here and there, and you kind of push them together, and before you know it, you've got some solid time together to actually be more productive. Yeah, now does that go against the grain? Because, you know, every with it's a we society, a team society, you know, everybody's talking about team, but... Doesn't solos go against the grain? Well, it goes against the grain of what, what's been sort of artificially foisted on corporate workers in that teamwork is going to make you more efficient. And in yeah. truth, we've discovered, and I hate people, that it doesn't actually make you more efficient. Uh, there's been studies that date back almost 100 years to a guy who, uh, I mean, this is a very sort of physical manifestation of it, but he, he was a, a French uh, agricultural engineer named uh, Maximilian Ringelmann. And he had people pull on a rope that was attached to a stress meter. And he found that as soon as you got over three people pulling on that rope together like a one-way tug-of-war, people started slacking off. Really? Because they figured someone else was doing the pulling. Ah. And they've, they've done more modern research that proves this is exactly what's happening in large teams, which is why we talk about soloists forming their own ensembles, which is two, three, or four other people that are really interested in the projects that are coming up. And they're not some company assigned team that has to do this task right all right so this soloist then if if has a problem needs to find themselves um like a personal cave then right yeah we have we have, one of the sections of the book is called dig your cave and it's whether you change your your work environment to have a cave right there at the office where right. your cubicle becomes much more a personal reflection of yourself or you find a space outside the office. It could be a corner of your garage. It could be at a neighbor's house if they've got a spare bedroom and you go, you know what, I've got to get away from my, my coworkers and my family for a couple hours a day. <laughs> Can I rent your downstairs room, Bob? Sure. <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. All right, so we talked about a lot of motivated employees. What do you, Can this book help somebody that's not motivated? Or maybe can it help the time bandit um, recover? <laughs> well, yes. In fact, one of the things we've been finding as people have been delving into the book is they begin to see how some of these ten least wanted uh, are reflecting back on themselves. And they go, wow, you know, I steal people's time like that. Or sometimes I'm a stop sign when I don't even know I'm doing it. Right. So as they become more self-aware, they also become more productive because they're staying out of other people's way. Yeah, that's what we need today's society. American businesses need that productivity, no doubt about that. All right, fantastic book. Uh, Mark, where can we get a copy of I Hate People today? Uh, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble online, and pretty much anywhere else books are sold. All right, co-author Mark Hershon. I Hate People, kick loose from the overbearing and underhanded jerks at work and get what you want out of your job. Isn't that the most important thing? Mark, thanks for being with us here today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kurt. It's my pleasure. You're more than welcome. All right, folks, head out today. Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, your local bookstore. Get the guy in the corner. He needs your assistance, too. He'd love to have your business, okay, in your local community. Wherever you can find, find books, this is where you want to pick one up. I Hate People is the main title. And we do appreciate uh, Mr. Hershon's time here today on Traders Nation, okay?